Bronchus arterial. Um, but but the, the, the conus um, is going to have to divide to get an aorta that is going to be over the left ventricle and a right uh, pulmonary artery still attached to the conus over the right ventricle. So the aorta really loses all of the conus and he's just as a valve connected directly to the LV. And so this is this is really delicate. You know, you I think you I still as I every time I look at the embryology, I'm just amazed we ever survive um, our our um, development. Um, so there's growth in a superior direction and it fuses with truncal swellings, which appear as bulges in the truncus and form aorto, aortico pulmonary septum. The right and left conal ridges form and fuse in the midline. The conal septum divides the PA from the a aorta superiorly. So the, a the pulmonary artery now is divided superiorly and, and forms parts of the membranous septum inferiorly. Okay, so it goes down and forms that membranous septum to give the aorta a direct connection to the LV that is not associated with the RV. You can see why the, the most common VSD we, we often see, and probably they're most likely muscular, but they go away so quickly often, but the ones we see persist are involved the membranous septum because of this is a very fine detail that happens. So conal truncal septation, you see our truncus arteriosus, it's over both the opening to the right ventricle and the left ventricle opening. Um, as, as it continues, we see a septation of coming up to, to make two ventricles to separate the left ventricle from the right ventricle. And now these conal truncal ridges and swellings form. And at the same time, they're not only separating it anterior, posterior, but it's also separating it right and left. So you see this truncal ridge, it forms this almost looks like a corkscrew that, that turns as it goes. So the ridges derive largely from neural crest mesenchyme. Um, so any, any, any ch child that has a neural crest deformity might have outflow tracts abnormalities. And that's why if we see neural crest de deformities in other parts of the body, we always have to do an echocardiogram. Histologically, it's similar to the endocardial cushions seen in the AV canal. And it forms the outlet bulbar or conotruncal septum, what we often call the supracrystal septum or the sub um, um, aortic or subpulmonary septum. And here, as neural crest cells migrate, the bulbar and truncal ridges undergo 180 degree spiral, spiral. So you see the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And they start out in, in one direction, and then they have to spiral completely up, where aorta initially is a little anterior. And then as you keep going up, it now rotates leftward, and then eventually gets posterior to the pulmonary trunk. Um, so the neural cell crest, um, neural crest cell uh, contribution to outflow tract septation is as follows. There's an importance of neural crest cells in the septation of the heart. And we see this in the chicken at 25, um, it, this was seen in 25 years ago. If the neural crest cells progenitors are removed before migration, you have abnormal cardiac looping, incomplete conal trunks, truncal septation. So there's these nerve cells that are involved in helping twist and septate the heart. Um, so if, if this doesn't work well, then we get truncus arteriosus, we have no septation. We have a VSD or tetralogy of flow or double outlet right ventricles. So the aortical pulmonary septum, um, and there's disagreement on exactly how this all comes about, but um, the, it's questions on where to define the site of the arterial valves as the distal end of the outlet. And so the truncus arteriosus is a part of the arterial system. Um, before the arterial valves are formed, um, segments are recognized by the mesenchymal tissue in the truncal wall, okay? So in, next is the mesenchyme between the fourth and sixth aortic arch extends inward toward the developing conotruchal swellings. And in the fusion of the ridges results in the formation of the aorticopulmonary septum, which gives rise to the aorta 
in the pulmonary artery. So you can see this twisting of the pulmonary trunk in the aorta. Um, uh, and Dr. Fatoon sees this very clearly when she's in the operating room and she sees how the aorta and pulmonary twist um, uh, around each other. Um, 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 so here we see now a twisting where you where now the vessels are septated and and we have twisting. And then you have now a connection that is going to be to the left side that is going to go out to the aorta and then to the right side is now you have the conus. So you can see how it has to grow down basically and form this membranous septum around the aorta because it doesn't have a conus. And here you see once again, this corkscrew like thing between the, um, uh, the intraventricular foramen um, that now is associated with the aorta and now the right-sided is allowed to go freely out the conus. Once again, we see this where the aorta initially is um, anterior or, or up as you go more cranial is anterior and the pulmonary trunk is posterior. Um, uh, but as you go down, it, it has to twist completely around from being pulmonary more anterior, and then aorta becomes more anterior as it twists, as it, as it, as it continues out the heart. Uh, this is important when we talk about PA bands in patients that have, that have major um, outflow problems because a PA band is relatively easy early out of the heart because the pulmonary artery is anterior. So you can put that PA band easily. But however, if you have a double outlet right ventricle where your pulmonary artery is posterior, then you have to actually go behind the aorta to put the PA band on. It's much more complicated for the surgeon. So semilunar valve formation, <clears throat> they're formed by four mounds of tissue. Right and left vulvar ridges divide into two cusps of each valve. And the intercalated valve swelling forms the third cusp of each valve. So you see these different, um, on A, B, C, and D and E, it shows the different ways that these valves form. So this tissue has to grow in, and then as it grows in, it needs to maintain separateness um, uh, to form three different cusps of the semilunar valves. Um, the spindle-shaped cells oriented with a long axis perpendicular to the axis of the leaflet. Then the leaflets become progressively thinner. They lose their cellularity and become more collagenous. So they become just a fibrous tissue. There's no apparent histological differences between the aortic and the pulmonary artery or the aortic and the pulmonary valves at the time of birth. However, as they develop, the pulmonary valves and pulmonary and aortic endothelium become different because they're, they're subjected to different amounts of pressure. Um, and that changes what the prostaglandin release is from the endothelial cells, which changes the very nature of the valves. And the um, development is complete by nine weeks of gestation. The cardinal intraembryonic system forms main venous drainage systems, um, the SVC and the IVC. The vetalin and umbilical systems are the extraembryonic symptoms, systems that contribute to the mature venous system. And there are complex changes that occur when new systems appear and old disappear. And each time an, a new system appears, there's problems there. And each time an old disappear, there might be problems there if it doesn't disappear. And this is why we so, see so many different types of venous anatomy. We have azygous continuation. We have hem, hemiazygous continuation. We have interrupted IVCs. We have hepatic veins that drain to different places. We have pulmonary veins that drain to different places. We have systemic veins from the SVC and left SVC that drain to different places. So all of these things, it's very complex, which leads to many different types of systemic vein abnormalities. The sinus venosis, um, as we said, um, forms the, has to form the primitive jugular, and the subclavian coming off of it. And then you see the vitellin and the umbilical ones help to form all this, but these major veins of the sinus venosus have to come down and pick up all the umbilical, the cardinal, the subcardinal, the renal veins come up, and then we have the subclavian and the jugular coming off the top. And it all joins the atrium through the sinoatrial foramen. 
That's why part of the right atrium is made up by the sinus spinosus, not just the, um, um, the primitive atrium. So here we see the sinus venosus and its different junctions. It receives venous blood from the left and the right sinus horns. Um, um, and, and you can see the vitellin lanes, the, uh, the, um, uh, the umbilical veins, the posterior cardinal veins, the anterior cardinal veins. Um, and, and, and you can see all these different things that have to come together with the bulbous cortis. Right. This is all, these things all have to come together and form this view that you see from the posterior view. You see the pul pul bulbous cortis going anterior, and we see now these veins are coming in the posterior type of sort of right atrial kind of view. Uh, as it progresses, we see an entrance of the sinus shifts to the right, because remember, it's going to form the IBC, SBC, and partial, part of the right atrium. Um, and you can see this here very nicely on the right side of the picture. So first to appear from the yolk sac as it passes to the caudal edge of the septum transversum and joins the primitive umbilical veins to form the primitive sinus spinosis. If this doesn't form properly, you get a sinus spinosis um, ASD. Liver buds grow into the plexus within the septum, and that's why the liver veins grow sort of come in separately often into the right atrium. Um, and then as the sinus venous drainage shifts to the right sinus venosus, the left hepatic cardiac channel regresses. So you only have a sidedness of how the hepatic flow comes in. The systemic venous system and the umbilical veins drains, um, they drain through chorionic villi forming the right and the left veins. There are paired veins entering septum transversum and join the primitive sinus venosus. These growth of these liver buds are within the septum transversum and it spreads laterally. And the, the umbilical veins uh, are broken up into sinusoids and develop connections with vitellin sinusoids. And then the proximal portion disappears. Most of the blood from the placenta passes through the left umbilical vein into hepatic sinusoids. The right umbilical vein is attenuated at the six to seven millimeter stage. Um, the uh, systemic venous system uh, with the umbilical veins is the right side sinus venosus becomes dominant, right? We become, our drainage comes mostly from the right side, not the left side. So the left side sort of has to reabsorb. The ductus venosus develops uh, by enlargement of the hepatic sinusoids between the left umbilical vein and the right hepatic cardiac channel. And it allows blood from the placenta to pass by the hepatic sinusoids and directly enter the heart. The cardinal veins, the anterior cardinal vein or the precardinal vein first to develop and it drains the cephalic end of the embryo. The posterior cardiac um, cardinal vein um, is inferior postcardial and appears slightly later and it drains the caudal end. The two cardinal veins join to form the common cardinal vein or the duct of Cuvier that enters the sinus spinosus. The, um, Distal anterior cardinal vein develops in conjunction with the brain, and gives rise to the intracranial venous sinuses and the internal jugular vein. The intersegmental vein initially drains upper limb to posterior cardinal vein. As upper limbs develop intersegmental veins from the limbs and it enters in the anterior cardinal vein, becoming the left and right subclavian veins. Are you guys appreciating how much this seems like it could all go wrong? Um, the anastomosis between the anterior cardinal vein develops as a venous drain and shifts to the right side of the embryo. So the 22 to 30, 23 millimeter embryo becomes left brachiocephalic vein draining head, arm, and upper body. And then the distal left common cardinal attenuates and the left anterior cardinal vein is routed to the right. So that's how we get this innominate vein that's draining everything and we lose, lose the left SVC. The proximal part of the left sinus horn and the common horn cardinal vein become the coronary sinus. And the tapering distal part of the distal left common carotid becomes vein of Marshall. The ligament of Marshall is a fibrous cord that continues to the left intercostal veins. And the coronary sinus always enters the right atrium. A persistent left SVC always enters the coronary sinus only if unroofed is there communication to the left atrium. Every once in a while, will you, you will have a, a, a persistent left cardinal vein that drains directly to the roof of the left atrium. I've seen that once 
and it may, messed us up in a tetralogy of flow repair because we had to go in and put a device in this left H anterior vein because we didn't understand why the child was desaturated. Um, the systemic venous system of the cardinal veins, the SVC is derived from the proximal part of the right anterior cardinal vein and the right common cardinal vein. And a junction between these segments occurs at entry of the azagus into the SVC. <coughs> Excuse me. The proximal part of the azagus comes from the right posterior cardinal vein. The systemic venous system of the cardinal veins, the development of the caudal end of the venous system is more complex. The caudal embryo drained by the paired bilateral systems, the posterior cardinal and the subcardinal, and the transverse anastomoses develop between these systems. The anastomosis between the two subcardinal veins develops ventral to the aorta and becomes part of the IVC between the liver and the renal vein entry. This is important as if it does not occur, the lower body venous return will not pass through the hepatic segments of the IC, IVC and you will get interruption or azagous continuation. The supracardinal veins appear in the embryo between the 11 and 15 millimeter stage and participate in the formation of the azagous system. In thoracic regions, the anastomos anastomosis occurs between the supracardial and the postercardial segments, and the intersegmental vein now drains to the supracardinal vein. Um, unnecessary parts of posterior cardinal vein involute and disappear. The supracardinal veins in the lumbar region anastomose with the subcardinal vein and they drain the lower extremities at the right side becomes dominant. The left sub, sub supracardinal vein regresses. You see what's happening is we have this bilateral system that has to become sidedness. Um, we see most of the outflow goes to the left side, but most of the inflow comes from the right side, right? The aorta is typically leftward and goes down the left side. The, uh, return goes mostly right. And so this is explaining all the stuff that has to happen for the right um, and the left sidedness to become in the body. The right subcardinal vein and the lower extremity veins become the distal part of the IVC, eventually connecting to the sinus spinosis. Uh, and the left subcardinal becomes left suprarenal and the left uh, gonadal and the right kidney connects with part of the IVC for the supracardinal system. On the right side, the fourth to the eleventh intersegmental veins enter supracardinal vein with the proximal right posterior cardinal vein from the azagous vein. On the left side, the fourth to seventh intercostal veins enter left subcardinal vein versus from the accessory hemiazagous, which drains to the azagous. Eighth and ninth intercostal veins enter caudal portions of the left supracardinal cardinal to form the hemiazagous, which then drains across to the azagous. This we often see this kind of drainage in uh, heterotaxy where you have IVC interruption and hemiazygous continuation. The kid we saw when we were doing the, the case with Dr. Allison um, uh, last week, what we saw was the fact that it, um, we had an azygous continuation in a non-heterotaxy um, child. So here we see this azagous vein and the sidedness developing in the, in the right-sidedness of the heart. So the absence of the hepatic segment of the IVC will give you an azagous continuation, which is exactly what we saw in this child. Um, the majority of the heterotaxy splenic cases are associated with an interrupted IVC, and often we see in that is, the, is a continuation to the hemiazygous system. So development of the venous system. Here we see the, um, you can see here the, uh, uh, the bulbous cortis and the truncus arteriosus. Um, then we see uh, the primitive atrium, and now this sinus system has to come up and, and fuse into that um, uh, atrium. Um, and then as we continue to go down, you'll see um, all, the, all, all the vessels that need to regress, you see, are where the X's are. If these vessels don't regress, then we have lots of different things going. And that's why there's so many different venous abnormalities and so many different pulmonary venous abnormalities that we're now really just starting to appreciate fully. And now that we have um, much better cardiac um, uh, uh, CTs. 
So the really the the we have the pulmonary venous system to talk through, and then the aortic arches, and then we will be um, done. So thank you for being patient with this very long lecture. Um, the pulmonary vasculature formed from a foregut vascular plexus. You see this sort of maze of things here. Uh, it's called a splanchnic plexus, and, and initially there's no um, connection to the heart. That's why you can have total anomalous pulmonary venous return because of this splanchnic plexus doesn't fuse into the left atrium, you get a, a, a TAPVR. So at four weeks, the common pulmonary veins develop and they connect to the heart. You see this through this common thing. This is why you can have, sometimes you don't have, you have a single drainage, um, like a supracardiac TAPVR, where you don't have individual pulmonary veins draining in the left atrium. Um, th so this is a supracardiac TAPVR. Um, and then you have a side of a connection of the, of the left septum, um, left of the septum prima. Um, obliteration of the connections to the cardinal the um, umbilical uh, vitellin veins. Um, uh, and then the common pulmonary vein incorporated in the left atrium. Um, and now it will continue to separate where you get four pulmonary veins draining the left atrium, two on the right side and two on the left side. And this is just a further septation of the common pulmonary vein. So you can see why sometimes there are four veins and sometimes there are five veins and sometimes there are three veins. And sometimes these veins, rather than coming into the left atrium, they attach to the SVC. As you can see how that would easily just attach to the SVC. So, um, the clinical correlates for total anomalous pulmonary venous return is you get this early atresia of the common pulmonary vein that leads to this cuts off and then you get TAPVR because it has to find a different way into um, the heart. Um, and it will either fuse with the coronary sinus, it'll, it'll um, uh, go to the inferior cardiac vein system and become in, in infracardiac um, TAPVR, or it'll fuse with the SVC and become supracardiac, or have a vertical vein up to the um, innominate. So here you see early treason of the right or left side of pulmonary leads to PAPVR. Um, so you don't have to have all of them go in the wrong wrong direction. You can have a partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, um, and. And there are many different possibilities of how this, this connection happens. It just depends on which, which vessels remain open and which vessels go away. So the connection between the common pulmonary vein and, and, and aorta is narrow, or um, a, an atrium is narrowed here. And then if, if this narrows, then you end up with this, this confluence behind the left atrium. And so the primitive atrium goes to the atrial appendages and the common pulmonary vein is a smooth portion of the posterior left atrium. Um, and the sinus venosus is a smooth portion of the back wall of the right atrium. So the, the atria are formed by not only the common pulmonary vein on the left side, but the sinus venosus on the right side. Um, and the primitive atrium really become the atrial appendages. Why is that? Because the atri remember where the primitive atrium comes from, it's really much more an anterior structure. And so the atrial appendages are anterior. The sinus venosus is the posterior structure, so is the common pulmonary veins, and they form the, form the posterior structures of the atrial wall. So aortic arch development. Once again, we're going from a bilateral arch development to a left-sided arch development. And we have a number of different arches. And when we learned this, we always had to learn all the ones that stayed and where they went to and all the ones that went away. And so we'll go through that today. So at seven weeks, we see this bilateralness. This starts very early. And then at seven weeks, we see this. We see a bilateralness at, at now we see, um, I'm sorry, we see the bilateralness here. And then as you turn the right side, now everything is, is unilateral, where we have a left arch. But look what that required to form a left arch. One, the right arch had to go away. Um, and then you see different arches come into play. Um, 
Uh, and you can see this by how many different colors are shown in this portion of this thing, even the arch. See this blue area here, which is the fourth arch. This is what is, is uh, the problem in, um, uh, for DeGeorge syndrome. This is why you get many times you get interrupted aortic arch um, um, from 22 Q11 deletions. So the fourth and fifth week of gestation, the aortic arches form to supply six pharyngeal arches. And they arise from the most distal part of, of the truncus arteriosus. And each pharyngeal arch also receives a cranial nerve. The fifth aortic arch never forms. So you have one, two, three, four, and six arches remain. Here's it in their bilateral function. This is the first arch. It's going to go away. And then you have the second arch, third arch, fourth arch, and sixth arch. Um, and then you see these segmental arteries coming down here. And then the dorsal aorta and the aortic sac and the truncus arteriosus. This is how it all forms. The first arch regresses and then the remnant becomes the mandibular aortic artery. Or, I'm sorry, artic artery. The second arch regresses and the remnant becomes the hyoid and the stapedal artery. The third, the, um, so they're not seen between after day 31. The third pair of arches appear in the fourth week and they become the common carotid and proximal internal carotids. The distal carotids come from paired dorsal aorta. The fourth pair appears just after the third pair and the right side persists in communication with the intersegmental artery and becomes the right subclavian artery and gives rise to the definitive aortic arch. Okay, so you see this is going to become uh, as this forms, as this forms, you see a break right here in the caudal part of the dorsal aorta disappears. Okay, so now we're seeing this is going to come out and this is now going to form to the right side and now we're just going to get a single arch going down to the left. Here we see further formation. Remember, this is now truncus arteriosus and the fourth appeared um, uh, and we see um, the forming of these arch and what in the right side persists in the communication with the inner signal artery and becomes the right subclavian army artery. We see that. And then it gives rise to the definitive arch. And as it continues to go on, watch it as it forms. And we see this, the six or the pulmonary arches appear in the sixth week. And so this becomes the pulmonary artery. And we see this truncus arteriosus giving the right subclavian here between a true right aortic arch and the fourth arch becomes the right subclavian. You have this small and nominate where they're connected to the right carotid. Then you have the left carotid. And then you have once again, the fourth arch here that is giving you the, the, the portion, sort of the distal aortic arch here. And then you have dorsal aorta coming down here and then the left subclavian coming off of here. Between this, this six arch also forms the ductus arteriosus right here, which is different tissue. So when you see what's happening, here's the first arch. Um, the, you don't really see where the second arch is really really necessarily forming. And then you have the, this is aortic sac. And then you have the fourth arch. You have the um, um, third arch here. Um, and then you have dorsal aorta here. And this is truncus arteriosus. So four segments um, between the aortic valve and the left, um, common carotid artery arising from the aortic sac. You have the segment between the left common carotid artery and the entry of the ductus arteriosus from that left fourth arch. Then between the entry of the ductus arteriosus to the left subclavian artery arising from the third, the seventh intrasomite segments of the left dorsal aorta. And then you have a distal to the left subclavian artery which are the unified dors left dorsal aorta. Arch abnormalities, a left arch and a retroesophageal right subclavian artery, there was a disappearance of the right fourth arch. So the left fourth arch remained. 
the distal right dorsal arch becomes the right subclavian artery and the right six arch also involutes. This is mostly asymptomatic. You might get some dysphagia with food and there's a higher incidence of this in Down syndrome. The right arch with the diverticulum of Comorel to the left subclavian artery. This, this, this is caused by the disappearance of the left fourth arch and a persistence of the left sixth ductal arch between the truncal sac and the left dorsal aorta. And the, the vascular ring is the most common after a double arch. If the right and left arches, you don't get um, involution. So here is the double aortic arch where you see the right arch persists. This portion didn't, this portion right here did not break and it should have died, but it didn't. And so if, if it would have died properly, then you would have had um, uh, a, a single arch, but because this portion pro distal to this, um, the right subclavian coming off, then it, it, since it didn't form um, break, then you get this double arch. And typically the right arch is dominant and this is either small or a tread. So that is all I have for you guys. Uh, um, Today, uh, I look forward to talking to you next week where we'll look at cardiac anatomy. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Really, you are amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I, th I think, yes, it was uh, long, but that's the embryology. We know that. And yeah, it's uh, all flows, they should follow uh, the books. Uh, yeah. the, just the lecture will give the overview of everything, right? Yeah, yeah so this is... The these lectures and stuff, what they're meant for is that it's just, it's part of your instruction. It's part of your thing. I, um, myself and Dr. Also cannot teach you guys everything. We, you have to spend a lot of time. I had lectures like this, but I spent a lot of time reading the books. I went on, tried to find videos, you know, they're nice videos. And that's why I've given you more resources on this to be able to do your own, um, uh, your own, um, uh, serve your own instruction, but then you come back to myself or Dr. Oslo and say, I did this, but I still don't understand that. Now that we are giving you a foundation, this is something for you to build on. And then when you have troubles with your building, then you come back and ask us for help. Okay. So all these lectures that we're going to be giving are building a foundation. And then from that foundation, you guys start building on that foundation and we help you with building problems. How does that sound? Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Thank you for your time. And sure. uh, I, will send, I will send this out to everyone so they will yeah, have. Yeah, uh, please just, just put the lecture in the group and I will put the video later yes. uh, for them also. Thank you. Uh, I, I wish that Dr. Wonderful. Cameron Thank was with us. He, he got problem with the connection. Thank you. Thank you, my yeah. friend. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, guys. Have a nice bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.